Everyone, welcome to the sixth webinar in our series, What the COVID-19 Pandemic Means for Refugees. If you're participating, please mute your mic. Please also note that we are recording the webinar for those who cannot be with us synchronously. All our webinar recordings can be found on, the, on our YouTube channel and we will post the link in the chat. I am Denise Duruiz, a social cultural anthropologist working with migrant farm workers from the Kurdish region of Turkey and Syrian refugees in Turkey and in Europe. At Northwestern, I'm the postdoctoral fellow of the Cayman Modern Turkish Studies program housed under Buffett Institute for Global Affairs. My co-host for the series is Galia ben Arye a professor in the Department of Political Science with over 20 years of experience in refugee studies as an academic and lawyer. This series is part of the new Colloquium on Refugees, Migrants and Statelessness that is one of the working groups within the Northwestern Center for International and Area Studies. The Colloquium is the new generation of the, of the Center for Forced Migration Studies founded by my co-host Galia ben Arye and works to broaden our understandings of the realities of refugee flows, asylum seekers, conditions of statelessness, internally displaced peoples, development and climate induced migration. The webinar series is made possible through the assistance of Denny Postel, Assistant Dir Director of the Center for International and Area Studies, and Cindy Pingree, who provides the administrative support to our faculty research groups. In this series, we try to achieve the difficult task of drawing attention to the dire circumstances in which refugees live and how COVID-19 makes it even harder and more anxiety producing, while also avoiding to represent refugees through hardship and endurance alone. It is true, refugees are both vulnerable and resilient. They come from many different backgrounds, living conditions ranging from crowded UNHCR or state-run camps to metropoles like Chicago, Sao Paulo, and Istanbul, as we represented them in, in our um, webinar series. They form various relationships with people sharing the space of the camp or the metropole with them, while trying to build their lives anew or to preserve their recently built lives. For example, the image we chose for our poster this week is from a mini rally in a different metropole in Turkey, Izmir, supporting and welcoming refugees to Turkey. However, it's an aspirational image more than it is representative, considering the racism, discrimination, economic hardship and violence that Syrian refugees face daily in Turkey. This past week, a 17-year-old Syrian refugee, Ali Alhamdan, was shot dead on the street by the Turkish police. He ran when he saw the police because he was trying to avoid a fine due to the curfew imposed on those below the age of 20 amid the coronavirus pandemic in Turkey. He was out on the street because he had to continue working to make a living. The policeman who shot Ali presented as so-called attenuating circumstances that he was fasting and that he thought that Ali was Kurdish since he knew that these were, would garner sympathy from a Turkish judge. Through this series, our hope is to raise community awareness by bringing you speakers from the front lines advocates, academics, practitioners, and refugees who can fill you in on, on their situation. Prior webinars brought information about the front lines in Greece, continuing work of um, UNRWA and Palestinians in East Jerusalem, refugee advo advocacy in Chicago, remote social support for refugees in Canada, and the experiences of refugees and migrants in Brazil. Next week, we are concluding our webinar series on refugees and COVID-19 with a final discussion on the situation in Poland and EU policy more broadly. Today, our focus is refugee trends and livelihoods in a metropolis, Istanbul. The format for today includes seven minute introductions by our speakers. I will then moderate a conversation with our speakers 
and we will then open the forum up for participant questions. Please post your questions in the Zoom box, um, Zoom chat box. My uh, co-host um, Galia will be monitoring the chat to collect your questions for the Q&A. You can post the questions to everyone or to our, um, Q our my co-host Galia directly. So our speakers, Zaid Haidari is the founder of the Refugee Solidarity Network and Yasemin Nazar is a social cultural anthropologist working on Syrian refugees in Turkey. Excuse me, I am searching for um, the bios of Yasemin it disappeared from here, Yasemin and Zaid. Um, they disappeared from my... It's at the top of the script. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. Zaid Haidari is the founder of the Refugee Solidarity Network and he will be speaking about trends in refugee protection before the pandemic and looking ahead. In addition to focusing on Turkey, he will provide the insights about other host countries such as Bangladesh and Mexico and how the lack of responsibility sharing has responsibility sharing has continued to the trends. Yasemin Nazar um, completing her doctorate at the City University of New York's Graduate Center will bring the perspective of everyday lives and um, livelihoods of urban refugees settled in a metropolis like Istanbul and how we can productively think about the added la layers of vulnerability they're likely to experience in this moment of a global pandemic. Zaid Haidari is an American lawyer with over 10 years of experience in international refugee law and humanitarian assistance. From 2010 to 2014, Zaid delivered um, direct legal assistance to in individuals seeking asylum in Turkey with the Istanbul-based Helsinki Citizens Assembly refugee program. He went on to co-found the Refugee Solidarity Network, a US-based nonprofit that protects refugee rights by developing capacity of civil society in refugee host states and advancing legal frameworks that uphold human rights. Zaid holds a BA in government and history from the University of Texas at Austin and a JD from Fordham University School of Law where he is now an adjunct professor teaching international refugee law and policy. Yasemin Nazar is a PhD candidate at Anthropology Department of um, City University of New York's Graduate Center. She has a BA and, in political science from Vassar College and an MA in Gender and Women's Studies from the American University in Cairo. She rec recently completed a 12-month ethnographic fieldwork funded by Social Science Research Council and Renner Grant Foundation, studying emergent social relations and care networks in the working class neighborhoods of Istanbul, Turkey. So um, I will now turn the floor over to Zaid and then Yasemin to do their introductions. Thank you, Denise. Thank you to Northwestern for the opportunity. Um, I especially wanted to thank Galia it's particularly exciting and nice to be speaking with her on that webinar. Um, Gali has been a longtime friend, colleague, and supporter of our work in Turkey and my organization, RSN. Um, with my time today, I, I hope to provide an overview of the legal framework that governs refugees in Turkey, providing not only some details on how the system functions today, but also some context for how it has evolved over the last 10 years or so. And in providing that backdrop, I, I think it'll allow for a more nuanced understanding of some of the challenges that refugees face, something that Yasemin is gonna go uh, into more depth about. But I also hope that my remarks, while focused on Turkey, will help shed light on the experience of emerging refugee host states in the global South more broadly, particularly in how we from the global North perceive and conceptualize the challenges that refugees and host states are facing and the ways to try to confront those challenges. 
So first, some basics, of which many will be familiar already uh, in terms of our group uh, of participants. Um, Turkey is a signatory to the 1951 Refugee Convention, but with a geographical limitation. Um, something that is often talked about in commentary on, on Turkey. Um, this was a, an option that states had and Turkey employed it, um, but the effect is not really quite clear in some respects. Uh, until recently, it meant that there was no long-term local integration prospect um, for refugees on European refugees in Turkey. Um, but even that can be qualified more recently with, uh, with the fact that many Syrians have been able to attain citizenship in Turkey, something that we can, we can come back to. Putting aside the international obligation for a moment, um, Turkey has traditionally all been seen as a, as a transit country. Um, in 2011, for example, when the Syrian crisis began, Turkey did not have national legislation on refugee and asylum management. And in those first few years, the idea of welcoming Syrians as guests may have been somewhat accurate. But by 2013, there was a comprehensive uh, law on foreigners and international protection, which was drafted and put forth to the Turkish parliament and adopted. And this legislation spelled out a complex architecture for various groups and facing various circumstances. So it established conditional refugee status or international protection for non-European refugees in Turkey. It established a temporary protection regime for individuals coming from Syria and seeking protection in Turkey. It did a number of other things in establishing a new uh, agency, a new bureaucracy uh, tasked with managing migration and implementing this law. And um, it set in place a number of safeguards, procedural safeguards and due process rights for individuals uh, within these groups and these profiles. This entirely new system was adopted at the very same time that historic numbers of foreign nationals were seeking protection in the country. It almost simultaneously in 2014, when this law was actually uh, to be implemented, uh, Turkey was sort of given the title of the world's largest refugee host country, um, something that was held by, you know, an accolade, if you would call it that, that was held by Pakistan for many years. So this is all happening at the same time. Um, and it... In, it's quite a challenge, in, to, say, to say the least. Uh, the journey along the path since then has obviously not been without, without its bumps um, in terms of implementing this new comprehensive framework. Um, some of those challenges have been addressed through legislative or policy changes over the course of the last six years, um, but others issues and challenges are implementation challenges and practical difficulties. Take, for example, the often cited issue of refugee uh, work rights. Turkey's law does allow for Syr Syrian nationals under temporary protection to have access to the labor market. But it uh, does not iron out, it, basically it's difficult for, uh, for Syrians under temporary protection to find employers willing to go through uh, the formal process to sponsor an employee for a formal work permit. Um, or take, for example, the right to legal representation. Individuals in Turkey under temporary protection do have the right to be represented in a number of forms and procedures, but the availability of such legal services is in fact, of course, limited. So by stepping back and looking at where the Turkish framework has come from and where it is today, I think we can better understand that many of the issues that are being confronted by refugees in Turkey today are endemic to a formalized system that takes time to improve and build up. And that, is, that improvement can best be done through engagement, education, and investment by strengthening the capacity of the institutions that are integral uh, 
parts of this new formal system. So the judiciary, the legal community, civil society, particularly legal service providers and advocates. And those things take a long time. Um, that's what has happened at the national level in Turkey. And I don't have a lot of time to go either into further into those things um, or into this next, to my next point, which I want to touch on just very briefly, which is, I think it's important to contextualize what has happened outside of Turkey during a similar time frame. And there we've seen an erosion of asylum norms and the adherence to principles in the developed world. We've seen increasing externalization and outsourcing of responsibilities and restrictive measures, which while at the one, on the one hand, Turkey has been trying to move in one direction, one could argue that much of the developed world in the global north is moving in the other direction. And I say that only to highlight that it creates an added difficulty in being able to do the already challenging long-term work that needs to be done in host countries like Turkey. So instead of setting positive examples, there's been a sort of race to the bottom, which counteracts measures and attempts to improve a system like that in, in Turkey. Global North countries should be setting standards at this time, not undermining them. So finally, the, the experience I've recounted about Turkey is one that I, I hope is helpful in understanding how much of the global South is faring at this time on this issue. As conflict and development challenges abound, forced displacement is at record high levels, and many developing countries are seeing themselves having to become longer term host countries. And they're often not being adequately supported in building the institutions and the infrastructure to manage these migration flows. Um, and so what has unfolded in Turkey in the last many years could very well be instructive well beyond Turkey and to much of the developing world. Um, I think I've basically used up most of my time, so I'm happy to pick up on any of those things in, in the discussion, and I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Zaid. Um, now we turn to Yasemin for her intro. Um, hi. Uh, so thanks for having me, first of all, and thank you, Zaid, for um, laying out the legal framework in Turkey. Um, so, I'm gonna get into the everyday lives, the more messy and complex stuff that, um, you know, implementational laws, how they work and they don't work in real life. Um, so just to remind ourselves, um, Turkey hosts now the largest refugee population in the world, around 4 million refugees, and 3.5 of these are Syrians under um, temporary protection, but some Syrians also have citizenship very small minority and some of them are um, on residence um, status. Uh, but the, mass, the vast majority are under temporary protection. And uh, the vast majority of refugees, uh, something like 98%, live outside the camps in cities and towns around the country. Um, and about half a million live in, in Istanbul. And that's kind of a, a minimal estimate actually. So just off, uh, to start us off, I think we need to decouple the image of the refugee from the camp to better understand what's going on in, in Turkey in general and Istanbul in particular. So during my ethnographic field work uh, in a few working class neighborhoods of Istanbul, uh, where Syrians reside in high numbers, my main research questions were kind of simple. Uh, I wanted to look at how do refugees get by and create livelihoods in a metropolis like Istanbul and what sorts of, uh, what sorts of social relations and networks um, they're building among themselves and with Turkish citizens. And one thing that became clear to me both in my data um, in order to understand everyday lives, struggles, uh, challenges, but also achievements and successes of urban refugees is that um, there's a delicate balance. So on the one hand, we need to attend to the specific vulnerabilities of this legally, economically, and socially fragile group, right, precarious group, while also not singling out 
exceptionalizing and essentializing them as a homogenous group defined only by uprootedness, displacement, trauma, um, or a generic sort of refugee experience. Um, and what I mean by that is we need to see refugees, including Syrian, Iraqi, Iranian, um, as diverse groups of communities and individuals um, who are living in cities and towns side by side with citizens, with other migrants, um, sharing urban sources, uh, engaged in all kinds of economic activities, present in all urban spaces, occupied by other residents such as um, uh, city streets, hospitals, schools, parks. Um, and in this sense, we can see that there are actually many overlaps between the daily struggles of the urban poor, citizens and migrants, and Syrian refugees in these working class neighborhoods. And seeing these overlaps in experience, but not forgetting obviously the differences, can help us um, normalize Syrian presence in our cities, especially after seven, eight, nine years of coexistence. Um, so this is my starting point for understanding urban refugee livelihoods during the current pandemic as well. Um, so as Dennis said in the beginning, my, I finished my research before the pandemic and I came back to New York City in January. And um, since then I've been trying to follow what's going on in Turkey and with my Syrian friends and interlocutors through daily conversations and just following the news. Um, and the question now I'm asking is, um, how are these existing vulnerabilities, right, both common with urban poor um, and also specific to refugees, are exacerbated during a, a, a crisis of this scale, a healthcare crisis? So um, to get at that question, I want to start with a story from my field notes, uh, because as anthropologists, we like to um, tell stories. And this is Amal's story, uh, which can be taken as an example of countless other working class Syrian families who live in precarious conditions in Istanbul. So Amal is from Aleppo in her 30s and lives in Esenner, um for the last eight years. And Esenner is a working class neighborhood on the European side of the city, known as a hub for informal textile workshops and small factories. Her husband works as a machinist in a small textile workshop located in the basement of a residential building, which is very common, um, producing uh, women's clothing. Like many Syrians in his neighborhood, he works for 10 to 12 hours a day with brief breaks for a salary below the minimum wage usually half or even one thirds of um, the salary for Turkish citizens um, with no social security, unemployment benefits or the prospect of a retirement plan. And also normally the youth in the families also, um, especially boys, work alongside their fathers as errand boys in these workshops, but not, this is not the case in, in Amal's family. Um, and Amal, like other Syrian women in her neighborhood, stays at home doing domestic labor, um, but she also does various kinds of jobs at home, including rolling tobacco to make cigarettes, um, doing beadwork on dresses and nightgowns, and assembling jewelry to uh, complement um, family income. And she does these things usually at night after her kids go to bed, she makes a cup of tea, listens to music, and works until call to prayer at sunrise. Um, like the majority of working class Syrians, Amal's family lives in a semi-basement apartment, which is not that bad because many Syrians actually live in uh, full um, basements or even second basements. Um, basically large rooms meant to be um, storage for coal or wood um, in, in buildings. Um, so even before the pandemic, Amal had already uh, complained to me about humidity and black mold that usually appear in these basement level apartments. So she was already worried about respiratory illness and asthma in her younger kids because these apartments don't have adequate uh, ventilation or they don't get sunlight. So I'm trying to paint a detailed picture here of one, one family that represents countless others. And um, this picture also gives us an idea about then how the pandemic 
has affected uh, lives in these neighborhoods. Um, one thing is clear that in these housing conditions, it is impossible to practice physical and social distancing and proper hygiene. Um, there are many cases where multiple Syrian families live in the same apartment to save on rent, to be able to make rent. Um, many Syrians, like Amal's husbands, are employed in jobs that cannot be done remotely from home during the pandemic. So not, and not working is not an option because they don't have the savings to feed the family. Um, the sectors employing Syrians mainly operate in Istanbul's large informal economy. And this means exploitative labor conditions, basically non-existent benefits, and refugees kind of make up the bottom layer of this cheap labor force. And with the economy faltering more so than usual, um, uh, textile production, construction work, restaurant work have all stopped. Um, so Syrians like Amal's husband have been the first to lose their jobs. They're the most expendable. Um, similarly, the kind of small economic activities Amal does at home also stopped due to uh, a sudden decrease in consumption and social distancing. So now they have trouble paying, paying rent, paying bills, uh, for instance, paying for mobile phone and internet, which are absolutely vital for refugees to keep in touch with family scattered around the world, including back in Syria. Um, so I'm going to stop here to um, uh, because I I think I've painted the uh, picture of livelihoods, and then I can get more into uh, other aspects of life uh, during the Q and A. Um, Thank you, Yasemin, and thank you, Zaid, for these wonderful introductions. Um, my first question is for Zaid. Uh, what are the most important things to consider for refugees as we try to emerge from the pandemic? Yeah, I think there's been quite a bit of attention paid to refugees as a as a as a vulnerable group that could be affected by by the by the public health emergency until now but we haven't been focused a lot of that attention hasn't been focused on how to make sure that that population is not left behind as we emerge as we as we look forward to perhaps rolling back some of the measures and some of the and some of the distancing and and lockdown measures that have been put in place i think it's critical to ensure that um we don't forget and leave behind this population, both from the perspective of ensuring that there are adequate resources and information targeting this group in, for example, uh, languages accessible and spoken by the refugee population about what changes are going to be taking place going forward. So it's a rapidly changing context in which we're all following, okay, from day to day, what are the diff different policies, procedures, and measures that we're subject to. And we need to ensure that refugees are also uh, targeted with accurate, reliable information and have somewhere to turn to to ask questions and seek counseling and, and, and information. Um, in addition, I think the in, uh, the, we've, we're living in at a time where misinformation and scapegoating um, have, have, are obviously issues that need to be confronted and we need to raise awareness about refugees and asylum seekers um, with national populations to ensure that this, uh, this, this particularly vulnerable group is not further marginalized as understood to be contributing to the health crisis. I think there is currently a underlying sense that this is now not a time to be accommodating to immigration of any kind. Um, and so therefore it makes it even more difficult to um, make space for refugees and asylum seekers as a specific subset of immigrants or migrants in any particular context. So it's about sensitizing, the, it's about sensitizing our, our communities to understand and demystify some of those misconceptions about refugees contributing to or making it particularly more difficult to combat um, that the health emergency. 
Thank you, Zaid. Um, Yasin, yeah, so my second question is for you. Um, you gave us an understanding, introduction to understand the livelihoods of Syrian refugees during the pandemic, but can you talk about the specific aspects of life? For instance, the educational access and healthcare access um, impacted by the COVID-19. Sure. Um, so healthcare access right now is obviously the, the most important thing. Um, Istanbul is the epicenter of the crisis um, in Turkey right now. And I, as I said, there are a half a million Syrians living there. Um, and um, so under temporary protection, Syrians have the right to um, seek medical care, free medical care at public hospitals, um, which is great. And I, I believe the government has announced that this includes COVID testing and treatment, but there are certain challenges uh, that arise here. One of them is, uh, again, with the temporary protection law, Syrians can go to public hospitals to get help, but only in the um, cities that they're registered. So once Syrians come into the country, they're registered at certain cities around the country. What happens with many of my interlocutors as well is that um, Syrians living in Anatolian cities end up migrating to big cities like Istanbul, just like domestic migrants who are looking for better jobs, especially in the large informal economy of Turkey. So um, families might have members who um, live and reside in Istanbul and work there in textile workshops, for example, but who might not have ID cards with Istanbul registration. That means, and, and I should um, add that since um, last summer, uh, there has been a very um, strict um, enforcement of this uh, regulation by the government and its police forces, um, and that, meant that a lot of Syrians had to leave Istanbul, but some of them still are there uh, with jobs or their kids go to school, but they don't have the Istanbul registered ID cards. So um, my fear is that a lot of Syrians are actually not going to hospitals in fear that they will be reported to the police um, or they will be refused treatment because they are registered in Adana, for example and even maybe they're afraid of deportations. Um, so that's, that's a big one. Um, Zaid already talked about the language issue. I think um, in terms of healthcare, definitely providing Syrians and other refugees, by the way, and asylum seekers with information in this very confusing time in their own language is, is very important. Um, you know, as a Turkish citizen, I read this stuff online and I'm confused, the, the news, the, the flow of information changes constantly. So all that information needs to be updated in Arabic and um, Urdu in, um, in many languages. Um, I will just add, I was talking to a, a Syrian friend just yesterday and she was telling me how um, she was trying to get masks, right? And her local pharmacy had all these um, signs and messages. They were all in Turkish. And she's very confused, like masks are essential, gloves are essential. So she was confused, do I get the masks from the, the, the pharmacy or not? So these like simple things uh, matter a lot during this pandemic, um, for sure. Thank you for that answer. Um, I work with Syrian refugees who work as migrant farm workers and that they will be for sure experiencing um, a lot of problems, especially considering the regulation of uh, working, being um, forced to work where the refugee family is registered because migrant farm workers by definition are uh, not going to be in the places that they are registered and it's probably not going to be even one place that they will be throughout a, whole summer, let alone um, implementing social distancing measures under those conditions. So um, continuing with Yasemin, I want to um, ask you about the anti-refugee discourses and xenophobia. Um, it increases in Turkey as in or as around the world. And can you talk about how the pandemic has affected 
these troubling dynamics? Um, right. It's, it's very troubling because for, um, for a while now, there's increasing xenophobia, anti-Syrian sentiments, um, hate speech, uh, scapegoating, um, verbal attacks that sometimes turn into physical attacks in different parts of the country, including certain neighborhoods of, of Istanbul. Um, and so this is, I mean, this has been happening before the pandemic. And what's also extremely troubling is um, for years now, there's almost this consensus among political parties who wouldn't be able to agree on anything else in the country, right? Uh, opposition and government, that there, there's a more of a convergence when it comes to Syrians, that Syrians pose a social problem, um, a political problem, an economic problem. And there's a lot of this message in the media as well that people pick up. Um, so during field work, I've collected so many stories of um, harassment and discrimination in everyday life. Um, so my fear is with the pandemic and it's it's going to be there's going to be a huge economic fallout that there will be more scapegoating of Syrians for um, anything from, um, you know, uh, economic um, downfall to rising unemployment to um, rising rents to even from the secular elite um, or the secular um, parts of the country sort of Arabizing our culture kind of argument. So all these, um, I, just, I just fear that are gonna be even worse with this pandemic and it's, it's full out. Um, and also I, so, so far the government has not announced any sort of separate data on um, COVID-19 cases when it comes to uh, refugees or migrants. We just don't know, we don't have that data. Um, and while that is obviously problematic, I also fear that um, if Syrians test positive, that there might be more of stigmatizing um, refugees as agents of disease or something like that. So, thank you for that answer. So um, there are, I see that there are a lot of questions in the Q and A chat box. So um, Galia, I want to turn it over to you without asking Zay the last question we had prepared. And um, I will leave it up to you to ask whether um, that question or the Q and whatever is post posted on the Q&A. So it's up on you. Yeah. Thank you, Dennis. So I want to start with a couple of the political questions, primarily because I know uh, one is from Danny and he has to hop off to conduct another webinar. So, and also because yes, yes, I mean, you were just talking about some of the politics behind it. So the question is, unsurprisingly, much of the discrimination and enmity against Syrians in Turkey comes from the right-wing ultranationalist end of the Turkish political spectrum. But perhaps more surprisingly, there's also anti-Syrian sentiment in certain quarters of the Turkish left. Many Turkish leftists associate the presence of large numbers of Syrians in Turkey with the policies of Erdogan, whom they fiercely oppose, and many Syrians in Turkey have encountered hostility from Turkish leftists who see all Syrians as jihadists or terrorists. Who, can you talk a little more about this phenomenon? And then connected to that is the issue of what, how the Turkish government treats Syrian Kurds from northern Syria differently you know, offers protection to them than domestic refugees from southeastern Turkey named Kurds, you know, so the labeling of different refugee populations as, you know, along political lines, um, um, who are deemed, you know, underclass or PKK related uh, terrorists, so if you could speak to those issues. Should I, should I go ahead? Go ahead. Um, so the, the first question um, what was, the, I, can you just repeat, it was just such a long question, but. Yeah, Danny asks long question. So basically the gist of the question is to talk a little more to the political situation and how it connects to specifically, like if it was a different refugee group coming in, I know the refugee cell, you know, it, it's yeah. Syrians is the main population, but what is it, you know, a little more about the phenomena about the specific intersection of the politics in Turkey with the specifics about the different ref different types of Syrian background, um, ethnicity. Right. 
it's such a it's such a well posed described question because it pretty much lays out the dynamics that I'm also very familiar with. Um, that's why I mentioned the the consensus among all kinds of political parties from right to the left that when it comes to the Syrian refugee issue, they all have a problem with that. And there's definitely uh, an Islamophobic element to it or anti-Arab element to it, anti-Islam um, element to it from the secular, more leftist sides. Um, and then there's a, um, definitely more of an issue with the government, for example, even though um, they have been very receptive of Syrian refugees from the beginning, they've always phrased Syrian refugees as guests, as temporary guests. Again, the um, temporary protection framework. So I think um, when it comes to Syrian refugees, we need new discourses and new understandings. That's why I try to frame um, the, the beginning of the introduction as let's normalize Syrian refugees as our core residents now, as urban citizens that have been here for almost a decade now. Um, and let's try to look at them from that kind of perspective that we share our cities with instead of, I mean, there are now second generation Syrians who speak perfect Turkish. Uh, they own businesses, small businesses, cafes. There's a lot of uh, investment in Turkey from uh, Syrian refugees as well. I painted a very working class picture for you, but you know, I don't mean to homogenize um, Syrians. There are different ethnic backgrounds uh, that the second question speaks to. There are Arab Kurds, uh, there are Arab uh, Syrians, there are Kurdish Syrians, uh, artists, politicians, upper class versus working class. So I think um, seeing that diversity could bring about a new kind of discourse that doesn't fall into that kind of binary as like our Muslim um, guests or threats, security threats. Thank you. Um, this question is more for, for Zaid, um, and it's about uh, is enough being done by the government in Turkey to support Turkey? Is it mainly the race to the bottom that is making it harder for Turkey to help? Or what other factors in the political sphere are fueling challenges for refugees in Turkey? I certainly don't think that it's only the race to the bottom that's making uh, it challenging for Turkey to improve standards and conditions. It's just one factor that I think is often left out of the conversation or analysis of where Turkey is right now and where it's trying to go. Um, there are loads of other factors. There's a number of other factors of which have already come up and been raised and discussed in terms of social and political dynamics that are, that are obviously contributing to the, um, the, the, the behavior um, and treatment on the part of the government. I think that um, certainly more could be done by the Turkish government. Certainly more could be done by the international community to support the Turkish government and Turkish institutions. Um, so it's, it's not a, it's, again, it's not a binary situation whereby the Turkish government is or isn't doing enough and what contributing factors are playing a role. Uh, there is no one singular contributing factor. I, I, I simply wanted to um, make sure that we're understanding that uh, Turkey doesn't exist in a, in a bubble. It's influenced by its external relations as well and it sees what's happening um, in other parts of the world on the issue of refugee and migration management. And governments learn from one another. They share practices. Um, these are things that are not occurring in isolation. And so um, it's, it's more complicated than just narrowing in and using uh, a narrow lens to look at Turkey. It's important to kind of step back and understand the broader perspective. Um, so certainly more could be done by all parties involved. So in line with that, what are, what about the agreements with the EU in 2016? You know, how are these, these resources working for the refugee community? Well, I think the, 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 the money that was committed through the facility um, was, was used to establish the European social safety net, the ESSN and the conditional transfer uh, programs that were put in place that, that really changed the landscape in terms of social assistance for, for uh, refugees in Turkey. But 
it, with huge numbers of three plus million, uh, those resources were stretched pretty thin. And it turned out that uh, the families that were eligible for the safety net programs that were being funded by EU assistance um, translated into a fairly modest amount, uh, if it can even be used to say that, um, uh, of money to support each family every month. Um, and so what, we, what we've seen, the experience of that uh, part of the EU-Turkey deal from 2016 is that the money that was committed by the EU um, wasn't enough to really provide substantial support to a large number of the refugees that are seeking protection in Turkey. And so if we really want that program and that, that mechanism uh, to work better, there'll either have to be more financial resources committed um, or there has to be other ways to restructure the programs. They did succeed in incentivizing, for example, many families not to have um, you know, a child choose work uh, to, to help contribute to the family income over education. But now we're at a point in 2020 where those programs that 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 the money that was committed in 2016 is effectively, um, you know, been spent and been used. And so the question that is on the table is, are those programs going to be continued in the future and are they going to be continuously funded? So as you're talking about that, one more question to you, and then we're going to turn it for a question for Yasmin. But um, one of the earlier questions was just a point of clarification about um, the, I know t Turkey has some camp policies and then urban policies. So the question was, you know, if I understood you well, 90% of the Syrian refugees are outside of camp. How? Any requirement to get out of the camp? You know, and then how does it connect to that funding would be? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think Yasemin wanted to make a point and she can also speak to this, but my, my response to that would just be that the camps, again, are, are run by the Turkish Disaster Relief Agency and they were set up in the initial stages to respond to the initial arrivals. And they reached a point where it was clear that people, they, there were not going to be enough camps to house the number of people that were entering the country. And there was already an urban refugee population, non-Syrian urban refugee population and a framework that already existed in Turkey for an urban refugee population. And so, the rest of the Syrians, it wasn't a matter of them needing permission to live outside of the camps. It's just that there, are, there is no more space in the camps very early on, and there was no other option but to live in an urban setting or semi-urban setting, register with the government in that setting, and then you know, f find your own housing accommodation in that location, and you're not being provided any housing not actually being provided any housing by the government. So it was more a question of capacity in the camps versus a rule about who could live in the camps and who couldn't. Okay, um, this question's uh, gonna, I think, pose more to Yasmin. So I'm sure you've read this book, but Eric Tang, who's also an, er an anthropologist, you know, in his book, Unsettled, has also similar stories, you know, about uh, the, the difficulties of living in what he calls the hyper ghetto. Um, but he cautions not to lump refugees together with the urban poor, noting instead that there's a, you know, a refugee exceptionalism, that refugee suffering should not be equated with the suffering of the hypo ghettos long-standing residents, um, and because their suffering belongs to another time and place, that it was indeed exceptional. Do you see this in Turkey in your research? That's such a good question, and I love that book, and I teach it in my um, class on um, anthropology of refugees. And my uh, students are doing it now, and this is their prompt for the week, which is also why I've asked you. <laughs> and, you know, we're based in, um, in New York City, so it's especially relevant to my students who are from the Bronx. Um, so um, that's, that's a very good question, and that's something that I'm struggling analytically as well. Um, and that's why I wanted to pose that, um, you know, I kept emphasizing on the one hand, when you have ethnographic data, really the urban poor and Syrian refugees living in the same neighborhoods like Asanar, Asanyurt, um, they seem to share a lot of hardships when it comes to economic problems and everyday lives. 
but at the same time, so there's that. And I think it helps um, to frame um, urban refugees in that, um, in that perspective because it enables solidarity networks, right? Uh, citizen refugee solidarity networks based on labor conditions, labor exploitation. So I think it can open the way for um, more communication and solidarity, class sol solidarity. Um, but at the same time, you're absolutely right that um, there are, as, as, as we've talked about today, there are things that are very specific to refugee condition. Um, for example, having to be registered in the city of residence. Um, very restricted mobility. So people who are, res if they're registered in a certain city, even to leave that city, people need um, travel permits from local governments, from the, um, I think the, the, the police forces even. So when you think about it, there are levels of vulnerability and precarity and restrictions that refugees face that urban poor do not. So I'm trying to think through, right, where those overlaps happen in my data and where we need to really separate them in order to analytically make sense of how, how refugees struggle in these unique ways. But again, I think to understand urban refugees, it's so important to sort of not look at urban refugees as one homogenous group, but as a very sort of, as a diverse group. And I must say that some of the um, neighborhoods that I, I studied, it wasn't only Syrian refugees, right? There was a diverse group of Arabic speaking um, migrants from Palestine, Palestinian refugees with Jordanian passports, um, Egyptian exiles. Um, so we need to also account for that. So, so it gets more complicated. It's not even just like citizens and Syrians, but all, all levels of exploitation uh, happen that it's, it's complex and we need to get an analytical grasp of it. Um, so follow up on that is uh, one of the questions is, I wonder whether there are any initiatives by Syrians themselves to cope with the current situation, such as any in-house treatments, home-based care initiatives, home-based private tutoring, um, you know, so what is going on in terms of that. She says, she, I know some individuals who get free tutoring in their own apartments, for instance, in the face of school closures, it would be great to have your insights about current initiatives. Right, so there's a vibrant um, Syrian and Turkish um, civil society in Turkey, uh, even despite the all kinds of repression that they face, uh, who work with refugees. Um, that's a really good question because it, it was one of the things I wanted to mention. A lot of Syrians and refugees depend on um, services and resources supplied by NGOs, um, both Syrian, local, national, international. And because of the pandemic, uh, we see that due to social distancing rules and also all kinds of restrictions and movement, um, most of those resources have been cut, which has affected um, Syrian families and refugee families. So that's another issue. I think we need to support those groups and help them operationalize, um, get back to their work, obviously not risking their staff, but um, families definitely depend on that money as much as they depend on the uh, EU funded uh, Red Crescent carts that they get monthly. Um, you know, there, there are many Syrian um, civil society organizations. Karam Foundation comes to my mind. Um, I think they do amazing work delivering all kinds of trainings and aid uh, for families. I was just reading, um, this is a Turkish uh, local NGO, but um, Tayla Bashu Solidarity Network just distributed aid packages for um, 6,000 families. Um, not just Syrians, but re refugees in the city with masks, gloves, uh, hand sanitizers, and information um, about COVID-19. So I think this is a moment to uh, definitely support in any way we can all these civil society organizations. Um, thank you. Uh, maybe, um, I don't know, Zaid, if you want to offer your insights into this, if not, Yasmin, how do undocumented refugees cope since they experience the double whammy of lockdown restrictions, lack of legal documents? How do they manipulate their way to go to work since they have to feed their families? 
I mean, that's something I tried to cover in the presentation as well. Uh, people put their lives at risk to go to um, work, to work in the textile factories, to work in construction. But again, most of those things have come to a halt. Um, so, um, and on documentation means not even getting that EU monthly money. Um, so it's a, absolutely a very difficult situation. And that's why NGOs, civil society organizations are absolutely important. And that's why any kind of basic income support the government is going to supply. Um, I mean, it's, it's very hard to follow because it keeps changing. The news keeps changing. But it's, it sounds like for citizens, there will be that kind of aid package uh, if they've lost jobs. I think that needs to be extended to all urban citizens, documented or undocumented, for people to like feed themselves and their families. Yeah, just to reiterate what Yasemin is saying, I mean, the program that we run on the ground in partnership with the local NGO Refugee Rights Turkey is receiving more and more inquiries about financial assistance because of whether it be formal or in large part informal work opportunities having been halted. And so, just as Yasemin said, I mean, we're looking at a situation where it, the situation in Turkey is not that much different from other places where undocumented individuals are facing, uh, you know, being left out of any assistance programs and eligibility for support, um, the same way that, that that's happening in Turkey, where you have a higher instance of informal labor um, you have a higher instance of, of even Turkish citizens working in the informal economy. And so if those are, again, requirements to be eligible for assistance programs, then that is that double, triple, you know, marginalization and vulner added vulnerability that the population is facing. And the proposals, like you mentioned, Yasemin, in terms of extending that support to people and not having it be strict eligibility criteria like that, like having formal documentation or working in the formal employment sector would be extremely important at this time since people have lost their livelihoods. Okay, do, do either of you know what are the, um, how are needs, like how are assessed needs for refugees who have physical and cognitive disabilities? Um, you know, is there, do, are they experiencing any particular, um, you know, issues uh, in, in that regard? And then related, um, how about the Syrian LGBTQ refugees, you know, treated? So people who aren't, you know, we're talking about labor needs and people who could work and, you know, enter formal economies. What about people who have specific other vulnerabilities or issues that they have to contend with? I think, Yasmin, you can speak more to this. So let me just really quickly on that point say that, that again, the, legally speaking, the framework in Turkey does do a good job of making a lot of exceptions for individuals with special needs. And the special needs category is defined under the law in a very progressive way in which, you know, uh, individuals with all kinds of disabilities and facing all kinds of circumstances are included as individuals with special needs and therefore are supposed to be afforded concessions under the law. It's the identification of those needs and the sensitization of authorities and others who need to be more made more aware of those provisions under the law and how to go about identifying individuals so that they are then able to um, take advantage of those provisions. And so I think that's one component of it, but I think Yasmin, you can speak more to how that plays out. Yeah, just to give a concrete example, for example, um, uh, the, the Red Crescent card. So it's given to vulnerable families, which is defined as families of five uh, with kids uh, under the age of 18, but especially if they have people, uh, members with disabilities, um, that can be documented in public hospitals, uh, chronic illnesses, uh, older folks. So um, there are all these criteria uh, that, um, that are looked at to provide services. Um, LGBTQ refugees is, a, is such, a, it's an issue in itself. And it goes beyond Syrians, obviously. I know there are a lot of Iranian, um, Iraqi, African uh, asylum seekers based on ju just those um, issues. And, you know, it's not 
something that I'm very familiar with, but I know um, civil society organizations, especially uh, some of them specialize in um, uh, providing um, psychological help, assistance, counseling, um, as well as legal help uh, to make cases for uh, resettlement in, in, in Europe, in EU countries. From my experience, um, LGBTQ, um, my very limited experience, refugees tend to see Turkey as more a, a transit country to be resettled in Europe. And there are, again, um, wonderful uh, legal aid uh, organizations like SAIDs that help um, these refugees. So we are at the end. Um, this has been an amazing, I don't want to cut you guys off, but I know that it's um, 12, 12, 16. So I would, we would invite you to give a final comment if you have anything you want to say. But as you do that, I just want to bring in um, one of the questions um, that I think would be great, thinking over the longer term. And this was whether, you know, are there, when we think about generationally, you know, three generations later, you know, normally we in the United States, when you think about other uh, refugee populations, you think about what they came to the United States, um, you know, their daughters, people imagine one day you're going to get a business and then the next generation will do better. That's part of the hopes of fleeing. So are there elements of the current urban refugee environment in Istanbul that make such a generational process possible? Is it possible to see a future, if not for yourself, then for your children and grandchildren? and your concluding remarks. Um, I'll go first. Uh, I think on that point, absolutely. I think the, the, my, with my focus being on the legal framework, I think what I would like to say in conclusion is that I hope as, 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 as is apparent, there is a now that there is a national framework in place. And why I think that's important is because Going forward, it, there, there is an architecture in place for advocates at the national level, as well as the refugee community to be aware of what their rights are under national law. And there are mechanisms to fight for those rights. It's not something that is now, in, like in many parts uh, of the world, where we're still fighting for uh, international norms to be um, adopted and reflected under a national framework. I think in Turkey, we at least have a national, uh, we have national legislation that can be used by advocates and the community um, to fight for their, for their rights. And on the generational point, that will only get stronger as um, people are made more aware of what those rights are under Turkish law and uh, both, the, again, the host community and um, the refugee community. So I think that what and what that legislation is meant to achieve and what it's meant to accomplish is to allow for people to become self-sufficient and self-reliant. So um, refugee communities are, it, it, it speaks to the issues we raised before about scapegoating and xenophobia where um, individuals should be able to become contributing members of their host community and that will happen as more individuals are educated through the Turkish system and contribute to the Turkish economy and people see that they're not necessarily needing to be on uh, you know social safety support but are actually just as Yasemin said co-residents who go out and work every day and live alongside them um, so I think that that's absolutely something that that we can see looking forward to try to end on a positive note. Absolutely. Yasmin? Yasmin? Yeah. Um, so we now have second generation Syrians who were born or growing up in Turkey, right? We have fluent Turkish speakers going to Turkish schools, um, making lives for themselves, making future plans. Um, so I think it's time that we really abandon uh, a, a temporary guest kind of framework, really open the pathway, legal pathway, but also socially, economically for um, coexistence, um, living in the city side by side as, as, you know, hopefully at least legally equals, um, maybe opening pathways for citizenship, not just for a very um, sort of elite upper class, white collar, professional, um, minority but for a lot of other Syrians who are working class, middle class, who have been making so many 
um, economic, emotional, uh, affective investments to their lives in this country, in, in Turkey. Um, yeah. And solidarity, solidarity, solidarity. That's, that's what's needed. Um, Thank you. So solidarity is a great note to end on. Dennis, did you have any final words you'd like to say to conclude? Thank you all um, for sharing your work, for doing that work. Uh, I am from Istanbul and I work on this topic and I still learn so much. I'm sure our participants who weren't as familiar with the context also learn so much and there, there are um, millions of thank you notes on the chat box. So thank you so much for um, offering us your insights and thanks to my co-host Galia for moderating the Q&A and making this possible by organizing it with me. Thanks to Cindy and Danny um, for helping this make possible. And also thanks to our participants. Um, I want to remind everyone that our next um, webinar will be the final session of our webinar series, um, Refugees, what the COVID-19 pandemic means for refugees. Um, but you can find, our, about, find out about our future topics on our um, Facebook group and our past webinar recordings um, on, YouTube, on our YouTube channel that both Cindy and Danny shared on the chat, chat box. Um, and again, next week we are concluding our webinar series with a final discussion on the situation in Poland and EU policy more broadly. So thank you for this excellent webinar and we are uh, ending our meeting here.